a well within. We're trying to stay six feet away. From oh, that's a that's a minimum, yeah. right? Right. So so the thing is this: I have a very hard time, right? Because I do kid. That's my fundamental. That's in my DNA, and. Uh, I think that's important. So I want to talk about, and, and I'll tell you why I, I don't take things as serious as maybe I should. I do, as I said, I didn't parachute into Sanford, Florida. I'm not Rambo. I didn't parachute. I went, I, I did have to upgrade to first class, though, to, to maintain my real social distancing. So I got approval from you, right, to upgrade to first class. <laughs> it was only like $17, so, right. so that's not bad. No, no. All right. So, but I do want to emphasize that because I think sometimes people, you know, see me as not really... Uh, what, what do you call well, that, Jack? I think the, the point is that um, we, we don't have the luxury of staying home, and we need we have an, we have obligations to our franchisees, to our customers, to our employees, and um, we we need to travel and and be there for right. our franchisees and continue to support them and support our business to ensure that it's you know it's 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 still thriving right. as much as po we possibly can. So yes, it's, Certainly you, you make light of certain things, but we of course follow recommendations and make sure that everybody is, is, is as safe as possible. Right. But we have to continue on with life because we, we don't have the luxury of just staying home and getting paid. So right. um, it's important that we right. continue to, to get out there and, and get things moving. Right. And by the way, I respect everybody's decision to do whatever's right for them, including, so I'm gonna to talk to Isabel in a minute, we don't put any pressure on our employees. I try not to guilt people into doing things, but I do li li live my life by an example. So this has not bothered me too much at all. I just follow what I'm told to do by the CDC. That's it. I don't do more. I don't do less. I don't wrap myself in bubble wrap and put myself in the basement. I, I keep social distance. I do all of these wonderful things. But uh, so let me bring Isabel. W welcome to the show, Isabel. Thank you. Now you've Thank been. You of course. Now, you have been a, really a great employee, and you are now coming to work during this very hard time. Now, just make clear to everybody listening that I don't do this. I don't put a gun to your head, right? So <laughs> yes, what? We need that right, we do. Need that. So, <laughs> so what? Uh, what motivates you to come to work? You could stay home and probably just stay home and watch Netflix, like a lot of people. <laughs> oh yes, Netflix. Well, I feel that. Just because I know it is this huge crisis, I'm not going to put myself on pause, my whole life on pause, just because all this is going on. I still do what you said, the social distancing, I wash my hands constantly, I'm wearing gloves at work, and I feel like it's important to carry on my daily work ethic and keep showing up at work and show that I'm here for a purpose. That's good. No, that's very good. That's very touching. So, in, 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 you know, and I like that because it's obviously coming from your heart. One of your coworkers today, I forgot, you know, she's, I asked her why she's there. I mean, I do question why people are doing anything they're doing because I want to make sure where I fit on the normal scale. So, and, and when I see people kind of acting as though the world isn't coming to an end, I... I, I'm curious why they are, because I do try to gauge myself with the rest of the human population. So we t I was told, who are you working with today when I saw you this Skyla. morning? Skyler. So I asked Skyler this morning, and she said she'd rather be with the dogs than be cooped up at home. So uh, Houndstown is an essential service. As a franchise, we work very hard to get that status, right, Jackie? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, we have a ton of uh, healthcare workers, we have nurses, we, we have social workers, we have a lot of customers who need to continue to go to work, and um, we're providing them essential pet care services. So without our employees, uh, we would not obviously be able to stay open and be able to provide pet care to these people. We just, before we were coming here, um, saw one of our greatest customers, Sandy, with her dog Leia in the lobby, and she's working seven days a week. She's still traveling into New York City. Um, she's exhausted. She's emotionally drained. Um, she, she, and, and she's like, thank God you guys are still open and you're here. At least I know that my dog can be taken care of while I have to be at work, out of the house 12, 14 hours a day. So, um, yeah, so, you know, there's a lot of things to consider given this crisis, and especially when you own businesses, multiple businesses, we have to consider our employees, our um, our franchisees, the dogs, you know, it's, it takes a lot to make sure that everything is right. running correctly, so that's what we work really hard to do every day. Right, 
And Sandy's a, a perfect example. She's such a wonderful human being. Yes. And she she lives, she works for the uh, <laughs> social services, Department of Social mm-hmm. Services, and she has a horrible, in my opinion, horrible, stressful job to begin with. Right. So this to add to it. So I really do. I really, my heart, you know, even though I've been in law enforcement my whole life and I've done, I've been involved in all kinds of tragedies, 9-11, uh, I was actually talking to Jackie earlier, and I asked her about the Cuban Missile Crisis. So one of the reasons I can remain somewhat calm during this is not because I'm something I have some special DNA. I've just been exposed to crises longer than most people because I'm an old fart. So that's really all that's it means. A that's a fact, right? <laughs> that, that's a truthful <laughs> fact. I know you, you. Yeah. So anyway, so I asked about the Cuban Missile Crisis. So when I was seven or eight years old, we had a, we had air raids uh, drills where, you know, we were in school, I was in Catholic school, and we had to hide under the desk, a, a sound would go off, and we all, all the kids in third, fourth, second, third, fourth grade had to go under their desks. So it's not much different now, they have the school shooting drills now, things that are really, you know, stressful on people. But, but over the years, so the Cuban Missile Crisis, for those of you who don't know, you know, we were threatened with obliteration, obliteration. We were gonna be bombed by Cuba, uh, one night during the Kennedy administration, and we were preparing that, our whole nation was crippled by that. They really thought the world was coming to an end that night. So I, I had that, I've been in, I was in the military during the Vietnam War, towards the end of the Vietnam War. I'm not saying I was a big hero, I was in the brig, I think, I was on an aircraft carrier. But regardless of the fact, my point is our nation has been crippled many, many times. You know who the son of Sam is, Isabel? No. No, okay, I didn't think so. This is how I test people's age. Son of Sam <laughs> killed six people in the 70s, and he had the whole new, new, entire New York City frozen. People wouldn't go out of the house. He was a serial killer, son of Sam, David Berkowitz, and he went around killing people. But because of the fear, nobody would be, I mean, the people were killing each other. There was accidental shootings. People went out because people were locked in fear. So I think that that's going to be kind of what what, how, what, what is the direction? What is, well, what yeah, what does all this mean that you're saying? Ah, <laughs> <laughs> what it all means is at some point you get. I I believe personally I'm desensitized because I saw I've always come out better than I have during every one of these crises that I'm going to talk about. Right, absolutely. We've, we've emerged, so. and 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 I want to talk after the break about how your safety not only your physical health, but your financial health is important. So you're no good to, I'm, I'm no good to Isabel if I go bankrupt, she's out of work. I'm no good to my family, my grandchildren. We have all of these things. Isabel has parents, we all have people in our lives. So that's what this show is gonna be about. Common sense, as subjective as it may be. So that's- but I think we also would love to share some of the things that we're doing as a franchise system to help uh, ensure that our other locations, you know, can remain open and serving, you know, critical frontline workers as well. So let's talk about that. Right, and how, and how, when we get back from the break. <laughs> and how we're going to come out better than when we went into it. We're emerging as the Bet Care franchise. Join us after the break, folks. Is it music? <laughs> is that what it is? <laughs> What's that? That's music. You can't hear it? No, no. How can you hear it? We don't hear oh. it. Oh, that's right. Well, sometimes I just hear music. I just hear right. it when it's not even playing. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's not shocking. I thought that was your ringtone. That was so funny. See, go up there. See who, how many people watch you without, without right. breaking everything. All right, I'll try my best. Try, to, try your best here. We got 10 viewers right now. Wow, 10 big. Sandy says hi, everyone. Oh, we love Sandy. Hey. We really do. I really, there's something I special about that person. I know. Just a uh, minute 30. Some people, I don't know how they do this. For you guys watching on Facebook, we got Canito sleeping over here. I got my two legged dog, uh, Rosie, over here. During the seven minute break, we're going to go outside. Isabel, if she doesn't break the camera, <laughs> the, the iPad, she's going to come out with she video. Won't. She won't. She's great. I love this kid. Oh, thank you. Feelings control. <laughs> for now. For now, yeah, yeah. For this moment in time. We'll see how long that lasts. Yeah. See what happens when I light up my cigar. I'm One minute. I'll probably get no. I'll probably have a mother calling me up. Yeah, exactly. Probably, probably not. Probably, <laughs> probably not. Yeah, no, she good. won't call me. 
Go on. My daughter smells like a cigar. <laughs> I'll smell like a fire. Right. It's better than other things you can say. Right. Yeah. It's a lot worse out there. Like dog pee. Yeah. I smell like that every day. Yeah. I'm not going to give you any <laughs> shout outs. You going to do some shout outs? Yeah. Yay. 30. Is there like a light so you know where he comes I see from? over here I have like a uh, timer. You should have a timer over there too, maybe. Maybe not. I don't think so. No, they're saying there's no audio on the video show. What happened? On the Facebook? Yeah. Is this microphone plugged in? Yeah. Should I see if it's... Maybe I have to Five seconds. It. Let's see. Yeah, you can stay up there for a minute. It's plugged in. Should I unplug it into a stick? No. I think, hang on, let's see. Oh, no, it's okay. Oh, they said it's working. Okay. Oh, welcome back, everybody. Welcome back to The Dish on Dogs, the radio show about dogs and humans and how we interact together in this world, how we share our environment with dogs, domestic dogs, of course, and humans, and how crazy we are most of the time. And probably in this, state, this point in time, we're probably as crazier than ever doing things that are getting going to get your dog out of balance because your rituals have changed. So, so we're going to talk about panic, fear, and dogs, and how, how this all applies to what's happening here and how it applies to your own physical health and your financial health. Um, so yeah, the dish on dogs. A mayor of Houndstown, USA, home to the happiest dogs on earth. For those of you who are just jumping and joining, we're talking about this whole health crisis, financial crisis, and I, I wanted to make sure people do understand that I do take this very seriously. I take care of my personal health, the health of my family, my employees, and my franchisees very seriously. Joining me is the very lovely Jackie Bondanza, and of course, Isabel Abatello. So I have two Italians from the Brooklyn. <laughs> Right? Where are you born, Jackie? Garden City? <laughs> Not for fun. <laughs> Probably Italy. All right. <laughs> no, I was not born in Italy. <laughs> Come on, you speak Italiano. Yes, I do. I just talk with a, like a dumb accent. Like a fake accent. Like a fake yeah. soprano <laughs> accent, yeah. But, but when I'm in the, I, I adapt to kind of whoever. You I'm, do, yeah. When I'm out in California, I say really weird words and talk differently. Because I, I think people think we, if, if you have a Brooklyn accent, you're ignorant. I think so. It sounds like dumb, I think, you know. But anyway, so I can adapt, you know, and I know that you, you, you have t different types of dialect that you can talk. You can talk millennial. You can talk in different things. Okay, anyway. Anyway, let's get on with the show. All right. Okay? Right, so let's talk about one of the biggest, the, the, the big enemy, besides the virus, of course, is an enemy of us, health enemy. But there's a bigger enemy, and enemy is panic. Fear is normal. Fear is a normal emotion. And fear is, is, is what you do and channel the fear, is whether you actually, from an evolutionary point of view, whether you survive or fail, right? right? So survival of the fittest. So if you succumb to fear in the form of panic, it's going to be debilitating and you won't probably survive. It, it's going to affect your health. It's going to affect your family's situation. And it's also going to actually affect your dog behavior. So all of this stuff, everything we do at Houndstown, is really all together, our business and our personal lives. We have fun primarily. Everybody that comes to, and maybe Isabel can attest to this, when you come to work, the number one thing you need to do is have fun. Oh, yeah. We have a serious job. This, these, our employees have a very serious job to do. And as Jackie was alluding to earlier, our customers now... Are, has shifted so the healthcare profession but when I you know it's important for me to talk about the unsung heroes right so we are obviously know doctors nurses and they are our first line responders just like at 9-11 I was in the police department and law enforcement firemen got a lot then the military got, got a lot of credit which they deserve but there's a difference between people that really, and again, I might get some pushback, but I'm retired from the police department, I'm retired from the military. I volunteered for both of those things. So there's a special place in my heart for the custodians and the cafeteria workers in 9-11, the stockbrokers that go to, went to work that day and they had no, you know, they, they, they weren't, they didn't volunteer to get blown up where some of the rescue workers, but anyway, we, we're open, our doors are open to people that work in healthcare, of course, that are going to 
they're the front line responders. Right, and what we're doing in a lot of our locations is offering a discount for healthcare workers, um, you know, to just to encourage them to continue to bring their dogs. Um, you know, because dogs pick up on, you know, what's going on at home, and if their, their environment changes, their routine changes all of a sudden, if they're used to coming to Houndstown three or four or five days a week, um, and all of a sudden now they're in their homes with you know three or four or five other people all day long. Um, it affects them. It affects their behavior. It affects their well-being. So that's why we're we're so um, focused on trying to convey to customers the importance of continuing to bring dogs to our location so that the dog has an outlet. The dog doesn't need to be quarantined. Luckily, this virus does not affect canines, no, it's huge. Um, which is fantastic, obviously. So we just need to make sure that what we're doing in our locations is safe and sanitary for the humans to make sure that when they're dropping and picking up, you know, we're, we're, we're following all the precautions. Right. But when the dogs are here, they don't know any different. So they really, you know, we've been trying to encourage our customers to continue to come. We're offering a ton of great specials and discounts during this month of April during this time just so we can help support our customers financially and kind of keep them keep them driven to, right. to keep their dog in their routine. It's so important right. for the dog, it really is. Right. And as you said, Jackie, they dogs don't know. They they're oblivious to what's going on here. And under normal circumstances, I tell our pet owners, don't project all your anxiety and all your personal emotional stuff on your poor dog. Our dogs, our dogs are dogs. They haven't evolved. I won't go into that whole spiel. But they're the same as they were for 30, 50,000 years. They want to come to Houndstown. They want to, what are you laughing about? Is this true or not? When yeah, these dogs so come true. in, are they happy they or sad? They're so happy. Oh, they're like happy. They bust right through the gate. They are so excited to play. Right, and right. So so that's what I say. And, and that's, that's, that's what we do. That's what we're all about. We take care of the needs of the dog. The humans, you have outlets for that. You have therapists, you have support groups, you have all these wonderful things. All dogs want to do is come into a playroom and play with other dogs. That's their pack animals, their social pack animals. By so sequestering them at home, I mean, if you have to, you have to. But if you don't have to, I'm not going to say it's abusive, but you're not taking the emotional needs of your dog and the physical needs of your dog into consideration. They don't want to sit around watching Netflix and me TV right. or even, And even if it's just a modified routine, um, it's still important to keep to keep bringing the dog, um, even if it's one day a week, just to, have, just to have a little bit of an outlet. And I will say that in the height of all of this, um, you know, and this goes back to kind of how we're supporting our franchisees and our customers, um, you know, it, we had almost 50 dogs today in Ronkonkoma. Some of our other locations had 25, 35 dogs, and they had multiple dogs that um, were there for the very their very first day today. Um, right. In our Ronkonkoma facility, we had one adorable little puppy. At our Garden City location, we had three dogs, three dogs three, who right. had their first day right. today. So to us, what that says is we really are an essential business. We right. People still need us. People are still prioritizing their dogs. You know, even as we're going through pretty much the height of this pandemic here in New York. So, you know, we, um, we're just continuing to be focused on making sure that we're, um, you know, we're here for everyone that needs us. Right, right. And, and daycare, over the 20 years I've been doing this, it shifted from being a luxury. When I first started this 20 years ago, right, pre-9-11, it was a luxury. People going shopping or playing around to golf, they thought it was kind of cute to leave their dog as a daycare, uh, in a, to a daycare environment. But now it's become a necessity because the economy forces it to become a necessity. People work normally 10, 12 hours a day, they're commuting, so they're away from home for 10 or 12 hours a day. What, how are they going to have, so we make pet care possible, and now it shifted to healthcare workers. Right, and I would say even, we do have a lot of healthcare workers that come, but there are still people who are working, they're still, even though they're working from home, so we're on 100% workforce stay at home order here in New York, we still have customers outside of the healthcare field right. who are working from home and are still bringing their dogs. Right. So what that tells us is that, um, you know, this is not just connected to people physically being out of their house. They're recognizing the necessity to send a dog to daycare, um, even though they're working from home, just like they need childcare, even right. if a parent is working from home. So it's a great um, reinforcement, I think, of 
what we do and, and the fact that you know daycare is important um, to customers and to the dogs. All right, that's exactly true, Jackie. And uh, yeah, and there is a surprising number of people, as I said, cafeteria workers at the hospital, truck drivers, orderlies. There's a whole world of people that have to go to work. They're an essential service, whether they're stocking shelves for your uh, at Lowe's or Home Depot. They are providing an essential service. All right, so now here's the story. That was great, Jackie. We're moving along. Isabel and I are going to go outside for a seven minute break. I don't know what we're going to do. We're going well, to I think you should just give people a quick demo on if they are stuck in the house and they're unable to bring their pet to, you know, to Houndstown or another pet care facility, give a little example of what people can do in either an open space or in their home to just like exercise the dog, maybe. All right, we'll do the best we can on yeah, this. Course. This was very impromptu, you know, I didn't really have this prep planned. Okay, the join us, ready. seven minutes, we'll be back. Facebook, watch us live. All right, hi, Scadito, you little one. <laughs> and let that dog come out and run around on really? a scoot around. I think she's cute. Oh, you think she's cute? I think she's cute. Dude, I'm, I'm a sicko. I think they're cute. Two legged dogs scooting around. The street. Where, the hang on. Where is it? You got a count. I mumbled under my breath that he's an right. asshole. <laughs> That's not, he didn't hear, he doesn't understand. Am I on? Yeah, I am. All right, let's go. We're going outside. We got our little friend, Canito. And what I like to always point out is the distractions in an airport, the odor of the carpet, this PA system. To a dog, this is, un they don't understand this. These things don't take place in the wild. There's no carpet in the wild. There's no glass. And there's certainly no PA system. So let's take a little walk around. So what Jackie was saying, you can do anything. First of all, teaching a dog obedience stimulates his brain. So just do, look at how relaxed I am. Let's see my her little boy, her wife. This is true. Come on, baby. She loves me. Let's go <laughs> her on the right. She's loyal. Um, and then we can do some agility. Here we are at the airport. Stay with me. See, Rosie's attacking me. <laughs> right. You with me, dear? I'm with you. We can do agility, right? Pop, 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 pop. Come on, come on, come on. Good. Look at this. So if this was my living room, I'm doing this in a, on my couches. But it has to be controlled. You need leadership, structure. And we do a little obedience. Flick of the fingers. The dog sits. If I step out with my right foot, the dog will stay. If I step out with my left foot, the dog will walk. So by giving him responsibility, psychological intellectual responsibility. I stop, watch the trick. Right foot, the dog stays. I'm holding this, this rope with one finger. Up. Left foot, the dog will walk. She's friendly, she, just, she looks a little weird. She's like me, <laughs> but I look a little weird. Okay, so here we are, we literally have the airport to ourselves. Look at my Rosie. Rosie girl, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Come on. Come on, come on, come on. I'm going to give her a little treat. She can't hurt herself. Oh, I mean, she could, but she wouldn't know it. No, we're, we're obviously careful about that. She's paralyzed in the back, but she, she has a wheelchair at home. All right, so what else can I do here, Isabel? I got the dog, I got people, wonderful people. We're here. We're social distancing. Life couldn't be better. Let's go back inside. Is there any other demonstration? How about going to get my speaker? Come on, Jackie. <laughs> the president, God forbid, I was going to do something. <laughs> it's in the, the little bag. What, hon? It's in the little bag. Just bear with me. The police are coming. I don't want to get arrested. So the reason I'm getting a squeaker is to show you that distractions grow. Uh, 
Look how I hold. Hey, Jackie, let's play catch. <laughs> the point I'm trying to make is squeaker is the sound of a distressed animal. <laughs> it usually distracts dogs. But the only dog that will distract is my little rover. It won't distract my, my friend. So love, structure, and leadership. We're going back inside. And that's it. Left foot, watch. Dog walks. When I stop, the dog will SIT. No talk. Dogs don't talk. Remember that. Left foot, dog walks. <laughs> I stop, the dog SIT. If I step out my right foot, the dog STAY. If I come back, let's say I step out my right foot again, the dog STAY. Let's say I step out my left foot, the dog WALK without me talking. That's it, it's as simple as that. Rosie, she's another story. Beautiful girl. Rosie. She's got her own Instagram page. All right, let's go back inside, Jackie, rolling her eyes. That's my social cue. Don't, don't be angry, don't hurt the door. <laughs> oh, perfect. All right. Whew, it stinks in here from Rosie. Let's see, did you doing good with that thing? I think so. Hopefully. I think so. Otherwise, this is just closed. Yeah, everything's closed. Okay, looks good. Let me close all this back. Alright. I can do that. Hey Mike. Take your time, dear. Alright, so let's talk about, um, Rob, let's talk about 9 11 and how Townsend was founded. Okay, okay, you'll help me with that. Mm -hmm. One minute. I right. keep the bad jokes to a minimum. Right. I gotta have a couple of jokes I gotta talk about. Mm, like what? I'll let you know. <laughs> There's some surprise oh. jokes. <laughs> there's always, there's always hey jokes. there. I want you to trip. All right, so everyone's tuning in. We got Mush and Steve. Mush. We got. How about Joe Steven. and? Someone said you were a shining star. I don't remember who. Oh, oh, oh who Gee. said that? <laughs> Probably <Dirty. a> bomb. <laughs> <laughs> we have Madeline, Kristen. Madeline. Um, oh, Madeline. Madeline said you were a shining star. Oh, Madeline. Pete, Pete, Pete yeah. Kristen, we love you guys. Kristen, we miss you guys. All right, we're going back live in a couple of seconds. On. Who? Ten yeah. seconds. Someone said they were new to the podcast and they're loving it. Well, it's not a podcast, so we're going. We're dropping a new podcast next week. We're going to talk about this, <laughs> right? We got to talk about our podcast. I'm learning that. I didn't know this wasn't a podcast. I don't even know what the podcast is. Not going to lie. <laughs> oh. Welcome back, everybody. Welcome back to The Dish on Dogs. I'm your host, Mike Gould, affectionately known as Mayor of Houndstown, USA, home to the happiest dogs on earth. Since our inception, I'm going to ask Isabel to guess. Since our inception, Isabel, how many dogs do you think have visited our Houndstown? Oh, a lot. All right. That's a good <laughs> answer. That's a safe answer. You want me to, what do you take a wild guess? Since we started 20 years ago, right before 9 11, take a wild guess. Definitely in like the hundreds. Definitely, okay. <laughs> so, right, she's not really close, but <laughs> almost, two, almost two million dogs since oh we started. I so know, much. so, right, right. So, since we started, we've taken care of two million visitors, right? Two, as you just saw, for those of you who are watching Facebook Live, we take care of dogs of all, we don't breed discriminate, right? So, we got dogs that. Probably 30% of the dogs, would you agree with this, Isabel, are some kind of bully breed mix? Yeah. Tell, tell us about some dogs that are just there today. What types of breeds and stuff at Houndstown Run Conference? We got pit bulls, German shepherds, Rottweilers. Um, what else would you say? Some I, I don't know. I think Dobermans. Oh, Dobermans. We yeah. have a Doberman today. Oh, we Yeah, Blaze. Dobermans. Oh, Blaze. Right. Yeah. 
The right. ironic part is all of the bully breeds are pretty much the most... They're the sweetheart. Sweetest dogs. <laughs> right. They're right. the sweetheart. The only guy I always laugh, the dog I got bit by, as I remember, is a golden retriever right. that bit me in the hand. Me so. too. Only yeah. dog I've ever been bitten by right. is my, my mother's golden retriever. Right. Put so that's an honor. Yet to be bit. Not yet. Not it, yet. See, so this is another amazing thing I just want to point out. Now, Isabel has worked with us for how long now? Oh, a little over a year. Over a year. She interacts with every type and size and personality of dogs every day. Every day. And she just said, she did. we don't get bit, knock on wood. There's obviously occasions that a dog is going to nip us. Don't forget, a dog's only mechanism to resolve their conflict is their mouth and teeth. We talk about that all the time. So they can't call 911. They don't have thumbs, so they just have their mouth. But we understand social distancing even at work, right? It's very important to respect the dog's space. We're not getting into their space. We're allowing them to come and do their own thing. And we don't interfere with that. And we don't we don't read storybooks to dogs. We don't, right? I mean, this is crazy, yeah. right? We dogs just do their own thing. And our competitors, who frankly, I don't know where they're gonna end up out on the other side to this, be very honestly. I never like to see businesses go out of business, but the word competitor is just that. They're our competitors. So we work very hard what we do for our franchisees, and I mean this, I'm very proud of this. We put so much behind the scenes that people will never realize. You and our whole team has been working 10, 12, 16 hours a day during this whole crisis. And that's serious. I'm not just making this up. Uh, our marketing team, our, our everybody, our insurance te people, our lawyers, we're really working hard. And that's the benefit. And frankly, I don't know how a mom and cop, cop not mom and cop, that's, that's me, oh, a mom and pop <laughs> right. can survive this because they don't have the financial background. We are, Poundstown as a franchise is very well capitalized to get through this completely. Um, so we're not, you know, at a risk, of, you know, so we're there, me, me, I wake up every day, say, how do I support my franchisees? Where do I have to go tomorrow? to get a franchisee up and running. And the ones I saw, as I said, I was to Las Vegas, and Jamie out in Vegas was like, how the hell did you even get here? <laughs> Me well, and Ed. It's a challenge. Your flight's got canceled, <laughs> right. and I think most oh people gosh. would say, well, I'm just, you know, use it as an excuse to stay home, but we have to power through. I mean, this is our personal business, and we take this extremely personally. And I think, you know, I speak to a lot of candidates on clearance calls, and we meet a lot of people at Discovery Days, and... Um, I, I think a lot of people wonder the difference between maybe a corporate pet care facility, you know, something like Camp Bow Wow, that obviously has a much bigger structure than we do, and and us. And I would say at the end of the day, we're we, this is our whole right. life, so we are very accountable. Um, and I think that that makes us work a lot harder. Um, it, and I think in a lot of ways it makes our system a lot better and a lot stronger and a lot closer yeah. because this is a family business and, um, you know, it's, we, we have a lot of hustle. We always okay. have. And I think that um, it's not much different with this pandemic. Right. That, you know, we're, we're still hustling through everything right. and that's what we expect out of our franchisees and our, and our employees as well. So. Right. Well, that's a good point. So the point is we vet our franchisees and our employees for the passion that we have. So we need that type of hard-driving people. So our franchisees, I met them. I was touched. They're like, they're ready to go. They're just, they, this is, right. they, they get up every day and figure out what they can do to make their friend, develop their franchise system. So that's very important. More importantly, our employees like Isabel and everyone else, they have the same drive. She could stay at home and, and say, look, I don't feel good. And she'd get paid for it and everything else. But she doesn't. One of the things that pop out in my mind are two things of our employees. So Corey, our marketing director, we had to go out to uh, Detroit to do their soft, uh, their grand opening. And he, this was back in February before all this all started. Right, of course. And unfortunately, by the way, our friends Pete and Kristen had to close down for a couple of days, weeks, maybe a month, because they're stuck in the auto d industry there. So they're not really, they just positioned their grand opening. There was a few things with their timing. So they chose, they made the right decision to close, take a breath and regroup. But my point I was trying to make was Corey, our marketing brand, our brand director, oops, uh, was supposed to come out to do the grand opening. He got stuck at Kennedy Airport because there was a snowstorm or something. Right. 
and he rented a car and him and his crew drove out. Against my advice, I said, Corey, it's not that important. We can do this another time. He got in his, uh, rented a van at Kennedy Airport and drove to Detroit so he wouldn't miss his, his videoing and all the different things that he had planned for that week. Yeah. The other person, of course, is my friend Ed, our construction manager, who just met me. He, he goes wherever. He went to Vegas with me, and uh, he, it took him about 18 hours to get there. He had to take six different flights. Mm -hmm. But it's the kind of, those are the kind of people that our system, our franchise system, uh, surrounds ourselves with and and that includes our franchisees so they're oh, absolutely. they're vetted for their passion mm -hmm. they're, they're process driven procedure driven they believe and trust us and they follow it right and I think in times like these it's even more important to remain steadfast and confident even though it, it's definitely challenging no doubt mm -hmm. but um, you know we have a lot of franchisees who you know they, they've remained that way and they have a very clear head and they're able to make really smart business decisions right. and you know these are people that are dealing with stress in their regular jobs um, you know people that work in the financial industry and uh, you know they have families who are healthcare workers and they have personal concerns but they remain very confident and just smart and and acutely aware of how to make great business decisions and I think they are really shining stars and yeah this moment um you know there there are a lot of them so yeah. to me it's very right. inspiring and um it just makes me feel great that people are, that our franchisees are really meeting us halfway and beyond well beyond that yeah and that's one of the things you know you can't tell people you know how to react in a crisis and that's right. you know i just did an interview today about crisis management how to thrive in these uncertain times uh and you can't tell people not to panic right. but we all have fear if you don't have fear you're psychotic so if people wake up and if somebody tells me they're not afraid of something there's really literally psychosis involved because fear is a survival uh, emotion and defense mechanism it's what you do with it right. and I do it naturally I just live my life until I can't I can't that's, you know you'd have to you, so, so, so but we can't tell people to do that and many of our franchisees, and there's personal financial considerations, and I completely understand it, and I don't l ever uh, guilt people in or try to browbeat them into doing something. I do like to lead by example. That's all I try to do. I do it for my family, my children, uh, employees, lead by example, uh, and maintain, have some fun. And, and you know, Isabel can attest to the fact, right, when I come to work, I'm a fool. I act like a... <laughs> that is for sure. <laughs> and I think it's important to note that, that even though there's, we have fun and we're lighthearted, it does not mean that we're not working hard and we're not um, serious about all of the things right. and challenges. Um, but, but just having, you know, I have franchisees texting me and we're joking around and it just brings a lightheartedness to the whole issue and um, makes it easier to get through the day and that's really the bond that I think right. we look for and I think you would probably attest that that ha happens with you and your colleagues at Ron yeah. Concoma, right? I would definitely say that. I feel like that's the best part about going to work is that it's just one big family. Like, anytime you guys come in or whoever's working, we're always having fun, but of course we're getting our job done right. and that's the best part. No, that's great yeah. and that's really, that's touching for me to hear from her too, really. So, um, yeah, so it's a question of what to do. Don't panic. That's what I tell everybody. After the break, we're going to discuss how really easy that is. You have to recognize in life there are certain things you can control and certain things that are not out of your control. You can control your attitude. You can control your behavior, uh, regardless of what fears you may have. But we're going to talk about that in detail. I, want, I forgot to give a shout-out to my friend Joan and Tom Sullivan down in Beverly Hills, and I don't mean California. <laughs> Joan Sullivan is the brain. She knows everything I'm talking about. She knows about the son of Sam. She knows about the Cuban Missile Crisis. She knows all. She's a, a woman of wisdom. Like me, I'm a man of wisdom. She's a woman of wisdom. Joan Sullivan. Okay. <laughs> is that it? <laughs> what? That's your sign-off? Yeah, we got one more segment, I think, or we're done? One more segment. All right. Now I'm going to let you do all the talk. Okay. <laughs> it's your time. Can so I talk about the World Trade Center? Yes, when you, I think when we come back, we can talk about how that sounds. Go see who's oh. looking. Anybody? Get yeah. up there. We've been paid a fortune for this. <laughs>
I pay this kid a lot of money. Right? <laughs> oh, stop. We got seven viewers right now. All right. Seven viewers. I thought we were going to be the most popular show in town. Listen, we're doing a podcast starting April 6th, The Dish on Dogs. Do you find it? How do you find it, Jackie? On it's going to be on iTunes. iTunes. And um, a couple other oh, podcast cool. platforms. Yeah. Right. And we'll also be posting it Monday nights at 8, and we'll be doing a watch party. So we won't be live, but we'll we'll do a watch party so we can comment and And Jackie, meditate. we have a book coming out, The Dish on Dogs. Is that correct? Yes. Coming out in the spring? Well, it's the spring now. All right, uh, All right. it's a little later. <laughs> I've, been, I've, been only, I've been working on this book, what, do you, what would you say, about eight years, seven Actually, or eight years? Eight. Yeah, okay. Seven or eight years. That's in fact, that's how Jackie and I met. She was going to help me write my book, and I was going to take care of her dog behavior. The dog is crazy as a shit yeah. ass rat and <laughs> I don't have a book. Oh yeah, the book hopefully will be out by the summer or the fall. That's exciting. Yeah. It's called The Dish on Dogs? We're going to call it The Dish on seconds. Dogs. <laughs> Yay, why not? That's a good name. Yeah, we're writing a book. I think you put her down. She's getting ready. I gotta get a haircut. You need a haircut? Or a beard cut. Something. I need a trim. Father's Change clothes. it up. Huh? Change it up. It's a little switch. I have to jump in the. You know, I'll, I'll have to get room. You, got, you guys got raises there. Less than 10. Yeah, I wouldn't trust those yeah. <laughs> on yourself. Those are kind of like fuzzy dogs. <laughs> <laughs> I can see him in the reflection. Welcome back, everybody. Welcome back to the Dish on Dogs. I'm your host, Mike Gould, the mayor of Houndstown, USA, home to the happiest dogs on earth. You know, we're going back in time. This whole crisis, I'm joined here by the wonderful Jackie Bondanza and the beautiful Isabel Abatello. And we're going back in time. It, Isabel can only go back 18 years, but <laughs> I can go back a half a, a half a century. I can go back a half More a century. Well, I'm saying, yeah, more than a half a century, but as far as my... Let's be honest. My, let, right. Okay. <laughs> let's right, let's be honest. Let's be honest yeah. <laughs> I'm saying I, my memory goes back 50 years of, 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 of societal incidents that were affected and crippled our world, right? So the older you get, this for you, for Isabel, this is going to be one of her many moments in life that crippled the, the, the uh, country. And when she's a certain age, this is going to be like a, a nothing. She's going to say, oh, I remember this. I remember the coronavirus. Or, That's just the way it goes, unless you believe the world is coming to an end, which I don't, that this is something that's tragic. We're going to work through, as we did the AIDS epidemic. For those of you who don't remember that, 1982, the AIDS epidemic, it killed millions of people. There was a 50% uh, survival rate at the, t the early days of the, the AIDS epidemic. And everybody, the first year or so, people were freaking out. It created homophobia. It created violence that you've never seen before. People didn't know if it was transmitted by a handshake. And, and it was just insanity. And it's similar to what we're going through here. Anyway, so, yeah, so, so I lived through those things. And, it, you know, it was a scary time. And that was a very fatal, highly, uh, the mortality rate was ridiculous. I think millions of people died. And it's just horrible. Um, so the point is... Yes. The... <laughs> the we, I think, collectively as humans have been through many, many, many things in our lives. And mm -hmm. the more that we're exposed to things, the more desensitized we become to, you know, to, to, to certain aspects. It doesn't mean we're not affected by them, but I think as business owners, as a pet care franchise, as employers, it's our duty to make sure that we are remaining as unemotional as possible um, while having obviously empathy, um, but that we're we have we're we're ensuring we have enough clarity to make smart business decisions, and that is why almost all of our Houndstown locations have remained open and thriving through this epidemic. And our competitors are closing, and to me that says everything. I I'm thrilled at the end of the day when I text our franchisees, Stephen Anthony, they have 23 dogs on, on Friday and several groomings and, you know, the, the pet care competitor down the block from them closed two weeks ago. So what's the difference here? And there's a lot of little nuances that are contributing to that difference. And number one is their leadership um, and being able to, to run a business successfully. And that's true of, you know, all of our franchisees. So, but let's talk about quickly 
how Houndstown was founded, you know, right after the, right before, I should say, the events of 9-11. So our system was essentially born out of rubble, right? You know, you founded Houndstown in 2000, uh, and less than a year later, the events of 9-11 happened. And so talk a little bit about that. Right, so that, that's what I like the franchisees to know, even the new franchisees that are really struggling right now, because when I opened in 2000, I invested all my money, energy, into opening a doggy daycare. I was planning on retiring from both the military and the police department. It was that time of life that that's what I was doing. So this, because of my involvement with the police canine units and dogs and law enforcement, this was a natural extension for me, doing something with dogs. So I opened my first location in Port Jefferson. It was very small. And on November, uh, September 11th, obviously the tragedy, I was assigned, I was one of the first people assigned to the rubble uh, at Ground Zero with a, a, an explosive detection dog. So. So, and then very shortly after that, on November 17th, I, I got military orders to deploy to uh, Naples, Italy. Just literally, they tell you, 72 hours, pack 50 pounds of uh, personal belongings. And, and you had just opened just this opened. business a couple months before, right. so your thought was, right. well, I'm going to close the I'm business, how can I continue to run it. Exactly, Jackie, exactly. Right. But what happened was I, I let go of the, all the anxiety, the control and panic because I had no choice. There was right. no arguing with the government. Right. I had to go. And I could close the doors or what I did was enlist the, my family and friends to do whatever was necessary to keep the door, doors open. And I remember very clearly we had one employee and first there was three dogs, then there were ten dogs. And what happened was all the rescue workers that were going to Ground Zero, who were working 12 or 16 hours a day, the first responders, they became my clients forever, right. and they stuck with us. So it was always about first responders, people that needed us. It wasn't a luxury, and that's why our business model is to be very straightforward. We don't BS people, right, Jackie? We, we offer affordable, the best service at an affordable price, and we don't exploit people. Trust me, New York City cops are pretty tough. They don't get BS'd into you know, paying to watch movie time with their dogs or give them belly rubs or Kongs. They're not going to buy that. So we don't do it. We never have. And so we don't exploit the emotional uh, well-being of our customers mm -hmm. or financial. So we had this affordable thing and it just took off. And then we opened a second location, which I sold eventually as a turnkey location. And I opened a third location. And again, I developed that. And turn that into a and sold that as an existing franchise. And I think through the years, um, you know, well, certainly after 9/11, when you thought the business wouldn't survive through that, you thought, well, this is it for the business, right? Nobody's going to need us. Right. Everyone's losing their jobs. It's a huge world crisis. But people continued to come. We lost some customers, of course, because they couldn't, they didn't need us anymore. They couldn't afford right. to come. But after that first couple of months, the business started to not only continue to thrive, it, it grew. It grew. Um, so, you know, I think the model was designed to adapt to these events right. in life that we cannot control. Um, and our operations are designed very specifically to be flexible and to be able to adapt to situations like this. Right. And more importantly, the next big problem was the 2008 housing crisis. That was a huge one. Remember, everybody was out of work. Right. Well, the that, bank that's like, guess what I'm Pretty much referring right, to. but 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 by the point was besides 9/11, that was an eye opener for us. We thought the world was crippled. Three thousand people died that day. One day, three thousand people died. Six thousand people seriously injured. So we thought the whole world seemed like it was coming to an end because nobody knew they were frozen. Then the 2008 housing uh, crisis and the banking crisis. I think it was 2008, and I thought for sure when people were losing their jobs, it was a deep, deep recession that doggy daycare was going to be the first thing to go. So that forced us to refine our system even further. We closed our lobbies from 12 to 2. We, we put our staffing. We really learned how to operate lean. And then, of course, as you quite correctly said, unfortunately, we lost some customers, but other customers filled that void in other occupations and other industries, and we came out of that better than we went into. I can't think of one crisis, and there's been at least a half a dozen that I can remember in the last 20 years, when we didn't come out stronger. Was there struggles and setbacks? Of course there is. That's what makes life fun and challenging, to overcome these things. Yep. 
Absolutely. And I think the key is having people at the helm of this who have that 20 years of experience, who understand what measures need to be taken to protect a business, to adapt to the operations, to make the business remain financially solvent and open, and to set the business up for the best it can be to come out of this. So, you know, we have a great perspective because we've had yes. all of this experience over the past 20 years. Yeah. And I think that is what makes us different. Right. And time will tell. Mark my words, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to emerge as the leading pet care franchise. When the dust settles, I don't know when it's going to be next year, this year, but Houndstown USA is going to emerge as, as the brand that people will gravitate to because the facts will speak for themselves. It doesn't have to be, you don't have to believe us, you don't have to trust this facts be, uh, speak for themselves. We're almost out of time. This was an amazing, amazing broadcast. I think you, we, you and don't Isabel. Say so yourself. Thank you. Here's a question I don't understand. So, with all these essential services, here's the the, the, the conundrum I'm in. Uh, liquor stores are open, and AA meetings are closed. So, doesn't this represents a pro This represents a serious problem, honestly. As you well know, I haven't had a drink in almost 30 years. But if I had the need to get the support of an uh, AA meeting, I can't go. But the liquor stores are open. Yeah. So. I hope that that doesn't create well, we, a big the problem. The rest of us have to get through this somehow, so we need the liquor stores open. Right, right. But there are real people in need. I just found that odd that AA meetings couldn't figure out a way of social. Online. They are online. It's not the same thing. You know, you have to be there in person and trust people. Anyway. Well, anyway, however you're getting through this, hope right. everybody's safe and we happy. We love you as all. As happy as possible. <laughs> And we're there for you, franchisees out there. We're there, but you have to just trust us. Trust the system. It works. We'll be there for you. Mm, bye. <laughs> all right. Good work. Um, all right. So what we'll do is what? We'll pack up our stuff. Should I end the live? You want to take end the, the live. All right. Bye, guys. Bye live. Everyone. It's been real. We'll talk to you. Podcast, April 6th, 8 p.m. Dish on Dogs Podcast. I don't know what it is, but it's going to be fun. <laughs>